Hello everybody, my name is Caroline Monaghan and I manage the Radley and Society at Radley College based in Mansion. It's lovely to see you all today. Today we're going to bring you the next in the series of our virtual archives events, this time focusing on Radley's changing landscape over the last 175 years. So we're going to move from the medieval landscape through to the environmental and partnership initiatives that are taking place on the site today. Now, before I move on to introduce you to our speakers, just a few boring housekeeping items. Please do keep your microphones on mute. However, we do want this to be an interactive session. So please, if you want to ask a question verbally of Claire or, or our other speakers, then just pop your hand up on the chat or in person and um, I'll direct the question, I'll direct you to answer at the, at the right time. Um, you can also, of course, use the chat function on Zoom, which I'll keep an eye on. And again, just direct any questions to any of our speakers. Please note that the event will be recorded. Um, this is so that other people who couldn't attend today could watch it. So just please note that. Now, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speakers. So we, of course, have our wonderful archivist, Claire Sargent, who's worked here for 25 years. So she knows this place inside out. She's going to be leading the conversation today. And we'll be brought, joined by David Anderson, our estates bursar, and Charlie, Charlie Herbert, Director of Countryside Centre Partnerships. Now, David and Charlie will provide their perspectives on Radley's changing landscape and talk to us about how it's likely to evolve in the future. So without further ado, over to you, Claire. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah. So hello, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of the landscape. And really, as Caroline just said, this is very much an informal event, inviting you to join us in talking about it. We're going to start the very first image we have here um, is the 1914 Ordnance Survey map. And one of the things that that does, Caroline, if you'd like to move us on to that thing. This map shows all sorts of things which have now completely vanished off of our screen, off of our world. We've got a shooting range, we've got the sewage uh, site down by College Pond, we've got, um, we've got the 18th century ice house marked there on the edge of what is now the golf course. And it's a real sign of, of change and continuity within the landscape. And if we move on to the next image, one of the things to remember about Radley's landscape is that it's almost um, historically, it's, it's one of the most important landscapes in the country, one could say, because the land itself has only for the last thousand years been owned by four institutions. Before the uh, Norman conquest and up until the dissolution of the monasteries, uh, the land around Radley village and what is now uh, the parkland at Radley, our pitches and so on, uh, was owned by Abingdon Abbey. They ran it as a grange, that's a, a farm land. And we, we have records from the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, um, obviously the early 16th century, uh, talking about uh, land management, about the deer park, which they had, which was actually has now been identified as over in Radley Lodge Wood, uh, orchard trees that they kept, and so on. So it's basically, it's been farmland for that, for that time. After that, after the dissolution, the land belonged to the crown for a very short time, about 30 years, and eventually was bought by the Stonehouse family in the 1560s. The Stonehouse and Boyer families then owned the land and developed it as an estate right the way through until 1815, at which point, due to various shenanigans with coal mines and canals and goodness knows what, they managed to bankrupt themselves very dearly, uh, in which point they, um, they started to lease the land out. But they did not actually sell it until the 1880s. 1847, it was leased by Radley College for 20 years. So we've been on site now for 175 years. We've owned the site uh, since the late 1880s. So you can see that actually what we've got is a landscape which has been curated, looked after, 
by very few institutions and by people who have been concerned about its care over a very, very long time for each group. What you can see here actually is the English Heritage LIDAR image of Radley. Now you've got the contemporary school, uh, including the donut and various bits of new building and so on. But what LIDAR does, uh, this is a light detection and ranging uh, system using uh, satellite controlled LIDAR, uh, lasers. And what it shows is every slightest bump in the ground. And what you can see here really, really clearly is the Radley medieval landscape. So you can see, as you look across the pitches, you can see the ridge and furrow of medieval farming practice. You can see the lines of long lost hedges and some roads and so on. And I'll return to what the LIDAR can show us about one or two individual features as well later on. But you can see from this how much is actually preserved of our history below the surface. If you walked across the pitches, they look absolutely flat, absolutely pristine, real tribute to the groundsman. But actually, if you look with a laser, this is what we can see. So if we move on to the next image, Caroline. And the aerial photographs, this is an aerial photo from 1952. There was a wonderful series of them, which were done in a strip of the RAF flying across most of the country. They produced an aerial survey. And on this one, it's actually possible from aerial photographs here in 1952 to see some of that ridge and furrow uh, in, the, in the pitches over there towards the back of the social and the, and the classics department, heading over towards the Little Wood. So if we move on to what some of the maps are showing us, the earliest map we have of the area, there are one or two sketches, there are tithe maps, um, and there is the, uh, the terrier phalanges of the 17th century. But this map done by Rock, this is Maps Rock of Berkshire in 1761. Uh, and one of the things that Rock did was that he actually showed us land use. So all of the symbols that he's using on this map, you can see the tufts, which are pasture. You can see there's a particular uh, wavy line that he uses for the river and for water features, which actually shows us that uh, there is a lake down towards the house next to Radley Hall. And you can see the pastoral uh, work. But what you can see very clearly on this, you've got the house, which is actually shown it's shown in plan. That is not an elevation. That is the plan of the house with gardens behind it, with the lake, a strange shape at this point to one side. You can see an avenue of trees leading from the house and going across the pitches now, which actually uh, matches now with uh, footpaths heading off towards Kennington. And you can see the Sweet Chestnut Avenue coming in across what is now the golf course. So you can see actually very clearly um, the landscape that was here before 1761 laid out. What that also has in that rectangular area around, uh, around the house um, is what is marked very clearly as a tailing fence and with the symbols for a deer park. One of the issues that we have in the past has been, where is the Abbey's deer park? Where is it this? And actually no, one of the, things that I, I have done recently with Radley Village uh, History Club is that we looked at the entire manorial system here. Uh, and one of the things we were able to do was to, um, sorry, I'm just seeing a question has come up about the sewage plant while I'm trying to think about, um, while, I, while I'm trying to think about medieval deer parks. Uh, one of the things we were able to prove was that actually the large wood has still got the configuration of a medieval deer park. So the deer park, which is here around Radley Hall, is actually a 17th century one. This is an, a, a developing grand country house landscape. We'll come back to that a little bit. So if we move on again, Carol. Uh, there, is, there is a question about the LIDAR. I don't know if you want to do that, head that off now. Or yeah, we can, we can um, It shows a square structure west of the Peachcroft Farm Estate, which is 
very close to where the archaeological um, excavations showed Romano British finds. So yes. it's more of a statement than a question. Um, so just adding extra information there. Yes, yes. I I, I didn't go back into the Romano uh, British work, but I'm, I'm uh, that also is visible on there. Um, and I know the work of the Archaeological Society in the early 1970s did a lot of good work around there. Uh, and of course, over at Barton Farm was a major Romano British farm site, uh, which is now actually, I think, under the Abingdon Skate Park, but it's that sort of area. Um, Abingdon itself is a really, really interesting um, uh, prehistoric um, uh, and Romano British town. If we move on here, what we've got is a little later map, which is 1777, and this actually shows us the house in elevation with a, a flag off the roof and so on. And what that's showing us also is a, a, a very typical elaborate garden structure in front of the house. If we move on, the next one will show us that actually, if you look down towards what is now G Social Patch, past the Ten, but beside the tennis courts of what has now become L Social, but when this photograph was taken in the 1960s was the warden's house still, you can see remnants uh, again of the, that garden. Unfortunately, the bit up exactly by the house, I suspect is a tennis court and not actually the, um, the crop marks of the garden, but the garden is certainly there on G Social patch. So, Everywhere we look, we've, we've got this history of the ground. Now, one of the things about the 1777 map is that actually it's showing us um, it's showing us something which is actually at its time not, it, it's an anachronism. Because in 1770, Capability Brown came and worked for William Stonehouse. If we just move on, we've got one more image from the deer park. How long did that deer park survive around from the 17, um, 1760s? Well, this was a drawing by a boy who was at Rabbi Hall School. Now, Rabbi Hall School was here from 1819 until about 1843 or so. Uh, as, a, as a private school for nonconformist boys. And this lovely drawing of the fallow deer in Radley Hall Park is by one of the boys from that school. So that deer herd was still here right up into the 1840s and still being kept as a park. So still also speaking before we get to the work of um, Capability Brown. One of the things that we see, uh, we saw on Rock's map there was Jesus, the Sweet Chestnut Avenue, snaking down from the Oxford Turnpike. The Oxford Turnpike was the major route uh, between Abingdon and Oxford, and actually between Oxford and London. And it went up there past Lodge Hill. And that was the main entrance into the estate house, in, into the estate. We switched all of our directions uh, to come down to what is now our lodge and onto the Kennington Road. Actually, that relates to the railway. When the railway and the railway station came, we stopped looking towards the Oxford Turnpike and we moved, or we, we kind of turned the entire view of the estate through 180 degrees uh, and started looking in, a, in another direction. But this lovely, um, fairly imaginative drawing of Abingdon from the 1790s actually shows a scene that you can still see from the top of Abingdon Town Hall. So along the horizon there, right at the very, very um, right hand end of the, um, of the image, there is actually a drawing which is Radley Hall. There is, that is the mansion of Radley. And then you can see the Sweet Chestnut Avenue coming along the horizon. Uh, so there it is in the 1790s. We know it was there before the 1760s because it was planted. And I think it's a part of the redesigned building of um, the house, the mansion from the 1720s. 
Sweet Chestnut Avenues became a fashionable feature from the um, when, well, from the arrival of Catherine of Braganza as uh, Charles II's bride as queen uh, in the 1660s. At that point, since she came from Spain, sweet chestnuts, Spanish chestnuts became a very popular tree. And so here we have, we've actually got a fashion in tree planting, which we're still seeing here in our sweet chestnut avenue. Uh, and there's recently been a, um, a national survey of the survivals of these, and there are 18 known survivors of a sweet chestnut avenue still leading to its house. And this one at Radley is one of that 18 that are still there in the country. If you walk along cheeses, and it's worth doing, it's a masterpiece of planting because you come from the Oxford Turnpike, from the lodge, from Lodge Hill, and as you walk down towards the house, the house is revealed slowly across the landscape, across College Pond. But your, 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 actually, your view is diverted. So as, as you come, if you look left um, on that walk, you're actually just below the ridge line. So you don't look in that direction at all. Your entire view is directed towards Berkshire Downs, towards the house. And it's that whole early 18th century stolen view. Uh, it, it's actually pretending that whoever owned this place actually owned all the land that you can see, all of Berkshire across to the Downs. So it's actually a masterpiece of planning and it's well worth it if you're ever in Radley, just walking along the Sweet Chestnut Avenue and, and getting that sense of an 18th century approach to the house because it's there, it's still existent. So in, 17, uh, in 1770s, Sir William Stonehouse employed Capability Brown. Now we know this from Capability Brown's own account book where he talks about so, uh, the bills for Sir William Stonehouse at Radley Hall. Uh, and we have also found the evidence for it in the Stonehouse family's own uh, uh, accounts books, which are kept in Berkshire Record Office. There's a wonderful statement where it just sort of says, Mr. Brown, 200 pounds. Uh, and obviously because he's Mr. Brown, you wouldn't actually know who you're talking to unless you're actually looking for him. So that is there. Uh, but one of the other things that we've also done is to actually work out, try and work out what it is that Capability Brown did at Radley. He was paid about £670, which is a middle rank. The magnificent landscape, somewhere like Blenheim, was £20,000 at the time. But there are quite a few, uh, um, particularly at this sort of level of gentry, and a lot of them actually connected with the Stonehouse family and with Radley Hall, uh, which actually was part of um, a, a, a patronage network, which actually, interestingly, is linked through Sir William Stonehouse's sisters and nieces. It, it's a patronage ne uh, network going through the female line, uh, which is something that is, is very seldom looked at. It wasn't known uh, when um, Singleton and Sewell uh, came and took over the site or when A.K. Boyd wrote his history in 1947, that actually this landscape was by K. Politi Brown. That was all the discovery following Dorothy Stroud's work on, on Brown um, in the early, very early 1950s. So what we've got is you can see from the tithe map of the 1840s, a change to the size, shape of the park. You can see possibly a change to the shape of the college pond, although it was something that was already there. You can see the development of shrubberies and so on. What exactly he did is not really obvious. I've done quite a lot of work on this and speculated of what, what you can see and what you can find. Uh, you've got shelter belt like White's Plantation being built down towards the end of the Hornbeams Avenue. You've got um, possible changes to the shape of um, the Little Wood and so on. There is one point you can see if we move on again, Caroline. This one's just gone backwards for me. Um, 
You can see right past uh, College Pond, there's a right angle. And that is actually a right angle ditch, which was an original line for that deer park of the 17th century. And here it is still on the ground. Um, it's just past College Pond. It's there on the corner of the golf course. And really unusual to have a right angle in the middle of a, of a, of a field ditch system. But there it is. So the only evidence we have are Perner's drawings, which are in the Tate. He did these when he was 14 years old. You can see a little bit of the paling fences. You can see the beginnings of sweeping away a lot of the fancy work and Perner's very typical, uh, Capability Brown's very typical uh, clumps of trees and so on that he would bring in. And if we move on to the next image, a key feature of his work, uh, which is the ha ha and that brown ditch you can see in a, in a line across the south side. So that whole elaborate garden that we saw has been swept away and we have a, a ha ha, which allows views right across the landscape but allows the, uh, the bucolic idyllic landscape to come almost up to the house. So if we move on again, this is the prospectus for Radley Hall School. Uh, and this is basically that ha-ha in action. You can see you've got uh, carefully positioned cattle and sheep and so on. And I know that, uh, Charlie, I think you're aiming to get this view to come back again, aren't you? We should convince David. But yeah, it would be lovely, I think, if we could resurrect that to a certain extent with sheep grazing uh, within the campus itself. Yes, it's, 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 it's very much a thing that we'd really like to, um, to bring back. But this, basically, this is the view that Sewell and Singleton saw when they came to Radley Hall and they decided that the beautiful place was what they really, really wanted to see uh, and, and to provide for their boys. They're not looking for a normal school, they're looking for a country house set perfectly in, its, in an idyllic landscape. And this is what they saw. And if we move on to the next, and this is what they, they tried to keep. So George Pine's uh, picture of 1855, we've got the end of um, the dormitory there, the end of our F social dormitory with dormitory clump still in place. And this is possibly, um, it may be a capability brown planting. I'm more inclined to think that it's actually that he reused some of the trees from that long avenue that went across the pitches from the house. But one of the things that was um, that Singleton discusses is that as they laid out the plans for the dormitory, for the chapel, for Stock Tower, all of those things which make up Radley. They were concerned to avoid the magnificent trees. So Radley is actually positioned to avoid the planting that was already in place to make the most of the landscape. So no great trees were, um, were felled to put up Radley's dormitory. So we move on. Ah, one more point to go back to, or we may come back to it. Um, one of the points that we're thinking about also um, is that when Sewell and Singleton came, so if we go back, Caroline, um, that's it, lovely. Um, when Sewell and Singleton came, they were able to hire the immediate ground around the mansion. They were the worst tenants you could imagine. They took the house, they, they took the house and that immediate surrounding on a 20 year lease. First thing they did was build that dormitory with the octagon uh, and a chapel. And you could imagine that if you're the person who's leasing out this land to these people for 20 years, this is not what you want. But it took the school a very long time to acquire the land. And one of the things that, uh, that it did was, was to slowly be able to start to use the parkland at the moment where they're playing cricket there in front of Dormitory Clump in the George Pine picture. They're actually, they're trespassing. 
but they're making use of um, the, the parkland, fallow deer are probably down at the far end in the wood. And gradually they were able to acquire the sites of, uh, we know as Radley. And the biggest part of that actually was in the 1930s when Vivian Hope realized that actually as Abingdon was growing, it was encroaching onto um, the green belt and onto the beautiful place. And that if action wasn't taken very soon, we would actually end up landlocked and enclosed within an awful lot of what they describe as, as really depressing bungalows and so on of the 1930s. This obviously is, is the height of the Great Depression. Um, we've got, I, I know we've got uh, old Radleyans who are saying, oh, I can't make it to the, uh, to the OR dinner in London because I can't afford the train fare and so on. Businesses are going to the wall. The school itself is, is just about managing to exist on, on fee income, but letting a lot of fees not be paid because of the depression. And at this point, they launched the first and their major fundraising campaign. Uh, which was when Vivian Hope said, we have to buy the land. We have to buy the land, which has now become Petrikoff Farm. We have to buy the, um, the Sweet Chestnut Avenue, if we can, as far up as the lodge. Uh, I saw on the chat, somebody mentioned there was a lodge building. I do have evidence of the, the, um, uh, that some of those have designs by Capability Brown. Um, so that's a part of his work. Um, but they're basically they're saying let's uh, let's future proof ourselves, um, and so we ended up with the Peachcroft Farm. We ended up with um, the Sweet Chestnut Avenue. We ended up also with the funding to enable the school to move forward. And David, I think um, I think you wanted to talk about a little bit about what plans we have for Peachcroft Farm now, didn't you? Yeah, by all means, uh, there has, of course, been some uh, uh, development on the Peachcroft estate over the years. Uh, and we have 555 acres uh, with the farm, uh, which is Peachcroft Farm and the Sugworth Farm, which was bought in the late 1980s. Um, we are taking the farm back in hand uh, in, in, the next, in the next year or so. It's been with three generations of the same family, and we are looking at uh, looking at moving uh, to a more organic form of uh, of <clears throat> of farming. Uh, with uh, it won't be us doing it; it will be a contractor. But we will uh, put down some contractual terms to make sure that we do this uh, more responsibly. And uh, the the other thing that we are planning to do is uh, plant 27,000 trees to the north of uh, to the north of the pitches uh, which uh, which link together the Radley big wood Radley little wood and uh, Bagley wood uh, so often when you put in for planning applications for uh, for new buildings they ask you to have a biodiversity offset and uh, and they ask you to do one acre or two acres and you get the people just put in these little squares or bits of land wherever they don't want to use them and you end up with this little island of sustainability and uh, what we're trying to do and there's no planning for this you know this isn't a planning uh, uh, contribution that we have to make this is something that we want to do we want to join all these together so that we uh, so that we have a biodiversity corridor. Uh, George, I'll try and speak a bit louder. Is that better? Better. Uh, again, the the other thing that we are looking at is just below the astro pitches is putting in a uh, two megawatts uh, solar farm and batteries so that we can uh, not be uh, so concerned with the enormous fluctuation in energy prices at the moment and going forward and, uh, and moving us away from, uh, from the use of 
uh, for fossil fuels. Just to give you an example, um, uh, six months ago, our monthly electric bill was about £30,000. This month, our electric bill is £120,000. Uh, that is a massive, uh, uh, that causes us massive operational issues and we have to rejig numbers and we want to try and do stuff. I was going to say under our own steam, but that's not the right expression, but we want to, uh, uh, we, we want to try and uh, use our own produced electricity to try and power the campus. Also makes for a good learning tool for the boys because this is going to be their future. Thank you, David. So that um, the, the forethought of, of Vivian Hope there in the 1930s buying the land is something which we are actually building on still. It's it's not just that we can um, that we have land to sell as we did with the Peachroft Estate in the 1970s, but actually now it allows us to think about um, increasing biodiversity, adding in solar panels, things of that sort. But planting, planting trees is not a, a new thing for us. So Caroline, if we, if we move on, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the people on this call uh, were part of the forestry group, which uh, Dr. Hugh Cardwell started in the 1950s, was certainly still there a little bit in the 1970s. And I know that he was working on all sorts of, of, of different things. One was study of the trees that we have, We've got um, the there was the oak. Um, if we move on again, uh, there was certainly a, a thinking about college oak uh, and its offspring. And I know that we have one old red lion who's been collecting um, acorns from college oak and growing oaklets. I don't know if he's on the call today. Um, so it is possible, I gather, to actually buy a a, a piece of college oak and grow your own oak tree from it. But what Hugh Cardwell also did was to, um, to contact old red lions all around the world and, and to be sent species, uh, different species of oaks. He was working also with Kew Gardens on this project. Uh, I know that, um, that though the boys from the forestry uh, group were uh, growing the saplings from acorns, uh, I think down in what was the kitchen gardens, which is which is now the, the walled gardens area for, for um, staff housing. And what that de developed into was an oak avenue, but also oak trees through an arboretum through the middle of what is now the golf course. And we're still tree planting. So we had 750 trees planted one weekend, a couple of weekends ago. Uh, we had the boys who were out, um, families were out, uh, some children from our partnerships group. Uh, and here we've got um, Charlie and David talking, uh, helping plant this. And Charlie, do you, do you like to talk about the um, this new woodland that we've planted and, and what it's like to get the boys actually out there in the mud on a cold day. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is arguably one of David's initiatives and it was part of the 175th anniversary celebrations, although it was the last piece in the jigsaw. Um, but it was lovely. It took place about three or four Sundays ago uh, on a Sunday morning. The grounds team and the gardens team had prepared the ground. They had drilled the horse um, and we had about 15 different species of, of trees to plant. Over the course of the Sunday morning, we had the majority of the boys from the school, all those that were in, uh, came out sort of social by social, wandered up there, um, and, and each planted one or two of the wick. Um, it's a rather lovely legacy. I think they enjoyed it. I think they all found it quite interesting. I mean, what's really helpful about it, not only is it going to increase our sort of biodiversity and, and the aesthetics of it, but actually it's on the perimeter between the golf course and Be Peachcroft Farm close to the area that's going to be developed over the next couple of years. So actually, in terms of privacy for the school from prying eyes, you know, it's rather nice to have that in place where it is. But yeah, so it's just, I think it's just one example. I mean, as David said, this is a small project. This was 750 trees. Compare that with uh, the tens of thousands that will be planted either side of Sudworth Lane over the next couple of years. But, but I think it's just indicative of, of where we're going and how we're trying to get the boys interested you know, sort of grab their hearts and minds and make them understand the importance of biodiversity, 
nature and conservation. Uh, these are all native trees, aren't they? Uh, yes, and uh, one of the discussions that we're having at the moment with the Forestry Commission is these are native trees based on the climate of today. Uh, now, when these trees mature in 30 years time, they, mo they might not be native trees uh, they might not be. Native is a funny thing because because half of these trees aren't native. They are trees that grow well in this environment. Uh, but in 30 years, uh, they may be a slightly different mix of trees. So we need to look very carefully at that when we uh, when we plant 27,000, which needless to say will not be the boys uh, planting them. Uh, it was good fun, but it was quite exhausting uh, corralling them in the right area. I think if we were to lift this by about 30 times, uh, it might be problematic. Um, George Cornelius has a question for Charlie and David while you're off mute. Um, I might just direct that. George, if you wanted to ask your question now. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to hear what you've just been saying uh, about the tree planting and um, providing some of the uh, your own electricity. Um, I'm in, interested in what formal links, i.e. membership, for example, um, that the school has or the group within the school that's interested in sustainability and the environment, what links they have with the major um, organizations, charitable organizations, um, like the Wildlife Trust, the Woodland Trust, Blue Marine, um, Friends of the Earth, World Wildlife Fund, etc., all of which I have now become involved in to a greater or lesser extent um, so that you would have a steady flow of uh, uh, conversation with those, uh, those organizations as to the progress they're making and maybe that would greatly uh, increase the degree of enthusiasm amongst the boys in question. Uh, well, I think if I can just tell you uh, where we are with the journey so far, and 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 one thing that is quite uh, has become quite apparent to us in all sorts of sustainability uh, uh, aspects of the college, we have to give the boys something to look at. If I show them a lot of plans of twenty thousand trees to be planted, they're not interested until they can see the trees. Uh, now we will become engaged uh, with them with all these. Uh, uh, institutions where appropriate uh, at that time. However, the way that we've come to this is we've engaged with Colvin and Mogridge, who are historic landscape consultants, uh, to set up our, uh, our planting uh, respectfully. Um, Charlie and I have both visited Farm Ed, uh, which is in Chipping Norton, which, uh, which uh, basically teaches sustainable farming. Uh, we've met with uh, Helen Browning Organics, uh, who she's also the chief executive of the Soil Association, and we've met the chief executive of the Forestry Commission, who are giving us some guidance. But that's our guidance ready for our application to plant trees, uh, because like most things in the world, uh, you need permission to do anything. You need yes. to put a tree in the ground. Now, as soon as we do that and we, we've got uh, acceptance from all the statutory authorities, as we move towards planting, which will be 12 to 18 months time, we uh, will be in a position to try and uh, uh, engage. Um, at the outset, we have arranged, we've arranged for the Chief Executive of the Forestry Commission to come in and speak to the boys uh, about uh, about planting and about native tree planting and how the landscape's going to change over the next uh, the next 10, 20, 30 years, whereas some other some trees that don't flourish at the moment may flourish. Uh, but but it's fair to say we we need to engage with the the bigger uh, uh, 
institutions, the, big, the bigger organizations, uh, as we move towards planting the trees. Uh, we're obviously, we're mindful, the boy's here for five years, and if we engage him as a sixth one at the moment, uh, by the time we actually come to plant the trees, he will have gone. Uh, so we're trying to catch, we're trying to catch a sweet spot of actually the education of the boys. Uh, can I add to that, George? I mean, a, a lot of this, as you'll understand, is very local. Um, working with local wildlife groups, Raddy Lake Trust, etc., uh, etc., et and a lot of it is very sort of low level, uh, hedge restoration, um, simple, basic ecological surveys, and it does tie in partly with our sort of community partnership activity and our school partnership activity. The other thing that I think is probably worth stressing, because otherwise somebody's going to ask it, is is how does this sit with food production? Um, and we're really mindful that what we are doing to enhance biodiversity needs to be done in, in parallel with maintaining peach crop farm as a center of food production. And I don't need to talk to anybody at the moment, you know, just how topical food security is as yeah. a nation, how important food production. So I think mm. you know, we're, we're in the foothills of this discussion at the moment, George. You've clearly got a great interest in it, and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Yeah, with, well, with you, about this. yes, well, you, you can, both of you get my email from Sophie Torrance, and uh, I'd love to hear from you and, and have a dialogue and maybe even meet up at some stage. I'm also thinking about uh, um, one or two boys eventually uh, having careers uh, in this field of sustainability. Um, my wife and I attended last Monday afternoon um, sorry, George. Sorry, George. I am going to just interrupt you there. I do apologise, but we do have to move other. All right then. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 we'll we'll, we'll, we'll no. chat to you separately. Thank I've you. got it. Thank you. If we if we move on, Caroline, one thing that we we do have is is that the boys have been involved for a very long time. Uh, this is the Coronation Avenue of Limes, which was planted in 1937. And individual uh, boys and groups of boys um, actually sponsored the individual trees, which are still there in that Lime Avenue. It leads up uh, from uh, College Oak past the um, past the oak trees, uh, and what they had then was was a little uh, lead plaque tied to each one. And very few of those have ever survived. This is the plaque that was presented by. Uh, a study uh, group, which was uh, Tony Money, uh, PB Sessions, and um, I think R.L. Harrison, and uh, and uh, Doiser. Um, so there are ways of, of, the, of the boys being related to and remembering things. And one of the issues that we have, obviously, is that quite often we have people who ask for commemorative trees, and we have a lot of commemoration across the site uh, in different pieces of planting. Sometimes it's much something like a, we have a magnolia for, uh, in memory of a plumber and a rose tree in memory of Rose Morse, who was the cleaner for art. But a lot of trees, and I think one of the things that we've done recently, uh, and David might want to come in on this again, because it's something which we are asked about a lot, um, is that recently we, we've established a policy on, on Free gifting, if you like, and, and commemoration, so that um, we actually know what's out there and where it is and how how it's marked. David, would you like to comment on that a little? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Over the years, it has to be said that we have uncovered stuff that we uh, uh, that we didn't even know was there because it hasn't been catalogued. Uh, but now Claire has catalogued as much as we, no doubt we will uncover some more, uh, <clears throat> so, some more bits, but uh, we, we've got now standard stone and standard plaques and standard uh, typeface so that these things look consistent around the campus. Uh, for example, I see some timber plaques that aren't going to last very well uh, and some, uh, and, and, and also some benches that look at some of the uh, specific views that were very important to uh, old Radlians, uh, but these benches, if we don't spend the money or get the right specification, they don't last forever. Um, so we are trying hard to catalogue what we have and make sure that we have a strategy going forward. Thank you. 
And one of the other uh, photographs that we see here, this is taken by Richard Langstaff when he was an H social shell in 1951. And this is a view, uh, I think, from the top of Memarch down uh, Chestnut Avenue, going towards the, the, the lodge there. It's a wonderful array of cars. And at this point, um, the Chester Avenue, the Addington Avenue, which was planted to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the school uh, in memory of the first Lord Addington who bailed us out in the 1850s uh, before we went completely bankrupt. Um, and uh, when it was planted, it was, it was a double row of, of chestnuts, horse chestnuts. And one of the issues that we've had recently, of course, has been chestnut dieback. And again, that's causing us to have to replant that particular avenue. Um, and again, David, would you, I know what people ask as they come up the drive, what's happening to the chestnuts? Uh, we have them surveyed by a tree climber every year. Uh, they are, uh, they do have a limited life. They have leaf miner and breeding canker. Uh, one of the, uh, you get these original, should I use the word crackpot, uh, that comes in and says you should inject them with concentrated garlic. Uh, because that fights off the leaf miners and uh, and it brings the trees back to life. Uh, they came and saw us, but he didn't give me a huge amount of confidence. Uh, so we uh, uh, we relied on the uh, we relied on our tree surgeons to give us the proper advice. Uh, we have now interplanted them with sweet chestnuts. Uh, we visited uh, a large number of avenues to try and find something that has the uh that that has the right shape uh and something that we looked at lines originally but we were concerned that one they were the when the parents parked their cars as you can see in that 1951 photo around them then all that would happen was uh all the bits would drop off the trees all the sap and would uh and would destroy all the paintwork uh so that was one thing that we uh uh, uh that we looked at uh, but we think that the sweet chestnuts, uh, as we can see in the avenue uh, to the west, uh, they react quite well to the soil conditions here. And I think we've planted about 10 so far. And uh, mostly the left hand side of the drive, the first 50 yards has no original trees and uh, it's not hugely noticeable. No, it, it is something where asked about though as, as people come along. So you've got informal planting with woodland and very formal planting with avenues and, and the, the sort of sense that it still has to be a working environment. So as, as David says, a, a, a lime avenue smells absolutely fabulous in spring, but it is a real uh, pest when it all lands on your car. One of my neighbors has a fabulous lime tree and I have to be careful where I'm parking. I must say. So if we move on again, we come up with the, the practical ways in which we use the land. We've, we've, we've talked about sustainability. Many people will be aware of the golf course. Um, and actually probably are not aware that, that we had one of, the, um, one of the earliest golf courses in England, uh, which was laid out in the 1870s. Um, and then laid out again by um, uh, in, in the 1890s by Arthur Croom of Croom's Tower, who went on to become a golf course designer. Uh, I think it's Liphook is uh, approaching its 100th anniversary this year and are planning to commemorate Croom's as its designer. Uh, and certainly there was also a nine hole golf course before the First World War and during the First World War. And the only evidence I have for that is um, one photograph which I thought said, well, I looked at it and thought, no, that's showing me the cricket pavilion. And actually what it says is nine hole golf course. So it's somewhere behind the cricket pavilion. Uh, and the letters from boys who were evacuated here uh, from Eastbourne College. And one of the things, uh, there are quite a lot of letters which all say, they've got a golf course. <laughs> Nobody in Radley is mentioning it, but Eastbourne are really enjoying it. So we have the golf course, but alongside of that, uh, if we can move on, what we have, uh, Caroline, if we move on again, uh, what we have are, are, are the grounds crew who look after it. Um, 
many people will remember the Smithsons who were here for um, man and boy, father and son for more than 50 years. Um, if we go back into the 19th and the early 20th century, we had the Pocock family who also did the same sort of thing. Um, we had Mile Aretina as gardener. And one of the big points that we have here, Adam King, Adam must have been here now for 20 odd years, David. Um, what, one of the great advantages that we have is, is, is to have continuity in our groundsmen so that they actually understand what they're doing and they can, they can develop and spend time on things. So as we talked already about the boys, um, the boys' short attention span, if you like, um, the grounds crew are actually totally dedicated to what they're doing and, and how they can develop this. And learning new skills, I, I saw them a couple of years back um, practicing traditional and learning traditional hedge laying, which I know that Charlie's talked about a little bit. So one of the things that brings us on to is, is, is the role of the countryside center and partnerships, things like the Beagles. And this is for Charlie to talk about what, what, um, what is the countryside center doing now with, with partnerships? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, the countryside center is very much sort of one of the more contemporary additions to the, to the Romantic landscape, although the idea for it, as many people know, came about about 20 years ago, just as the Hunt Band was coming in. Uh, but it came to fruition about four to five years ago after the old Beagle kennels uh, in Radley were sold off um, for development. And um, in their place, a six acre site um, on the other side of the golf course, just to the sort of northeast of Cheetahs, was selected as the new home of the, the Countryside Centre. But I suppose it, it, it performs three functions, the Countryside Centre. Firstly, it is still the home of the Radley College Beagles, uh, and it has up there a state-of-the-art kennels, which I suspect many of our listeners have, have visited. It's also a, um, a small holding uh, on which we've got some livestock, uh, which is growing in diversity and in numbers. Um, but I mean, the key part to it now, and the reason I've come in, is its third role as a sort of countryside education centre, a platform uh, by which we can educate our boys and our strategic partners from other schools and charities uh, about those issues that we touched upon earlier, sort of sustainability, biodiversity, environmental issues, farming in the 21st century, food production, sustainability, and also some country skills and field sports. So it's a sort of, the aim of the Countryside Centre is, is to do all of that. Um, where we are with it at the moment, four years in, we're still developing the centre. We're about to expand from six acres uh, in its current site to take on another 14 or 15 acres, which will allow us to further expand the sort of a range of the livestock that we hold, uh, but also to do more work in terms of sort of nature reserves, take back in hand a small pond, some hedgerow, little woodland spinny. Uh, the second thing we're doing is developing the internal offer. Uh, the warden rightly wants to get better use out of that countryside centre. This year, for the first time ever, we've had a mandatory shell programme. Each, each shell in his first year here at Radley will now spend between four and six Wednesday afternoons up at the countryside centre, being introduced to the work of what we do uh, and those themes that I spoke about. And then the third aspect, and, and perhaps the most exciting, is expanding the external offer. Uh, how do we use the countryside centre and how do we use the land holdings here, Peachcroft Farm, the campus, the countryside centre, to work with our partners? And, and this, is, this is fascinating at the moment. You know, we, the obvious stuff from simple farm visits from primary schools, but we've, we've partnered with a brain injury charity in Kennington who come to us once a week to conduct mental and physical rehabilitation for adults with brain injury, um, brain injuries. Uh, and then we're doing some interesting work at the moment with some of the local state schools uh, on alternative provision. Countryside focused alternate provision from teenage children that have either been excluded from school or on the cusp of it. So it's, it's using that countryside centre, using the, the rich 800 acre assets which we've got here for the wider use of the school, the local community and our partners. Thank you. And it's it's seeing the film of, of what's going on we've had them we've had you all roasting chestnuts and uh, doing some wonderful fun country activities talking you mentioned college pond there and if we go back to the lidar uh one of the questions has always been what well, what is the origin of college pond 
And actually the LIDAR shows, you can see the lines of ridge and furrow plowing going across it from the medieval period. And that actually joins up on both sides, which kind of implies that um, College Pond as it stands, as a large body of water, uh, is a relatively recent uh, development. Obviously it's, it's, it's sustained because it's at the lowest point. Uh, I know uh, we, we, we saw it marked on rocks back. I know that it was set up for carp fishing um, in the 1760s because I, I've seen the, um, there's a wonderful page on the Stonehouse family archive accounts, uh, accounts in the archives of Berkshire, um, where in the middle of, of talking about paying the servants and everything else, there's just a list of carp by weight that have been caught in the pond. Um, so it is pre-capability brown, but what he possibly did was to change the shape of it, make it more serpentine. But one of the aspects of all of the sustainability at the moment and has been to, first of all, to open up the view as you come down uh, Cheezers to the house um, across the pond, but also to repair and restock the pond itself. And that's, again, one of the countryside pursuits that you've been looking at, isn't it, is, is the, um, the Trout Fishing Society are back. So they're there and doing all of those different things. And if we move on, to the next thing. We've talked constantly about uh, biodiversity and about sustainability and surveys. The first survey of um, the Radley district, history, botany, etymology, and geology was actually put, uh, done by the Boys of the Natural History Society in 1906 and published uh, re redone and published in 1912 um, as a booklet. It's, abs it's, it's a very, very detailed survey. You've got um, the Latin names of everything. You've got a, a, a full uh, scientific study here. This was redone and revisited in the 1940s. Um, and both that 1912 and the 1940s um, Surveys are available online at on the Radley Archives um, website. So you can actually look through that uh, and it's available for searching. And I know one of the things that David was saying to me the other day is that, that the next biodiversity survey is, is starting now. Is that the case, David? Uh, yes, it was started uh, two weeks ago, but we are running through uh, all of our land holding uh, that, that's uh, well, not the whole farm, but uh, uh, the perimeter of the campus to encompass also the countryside centre. We, we are also looking at uh, certain aspects of it, like the bat monitoring and what have you, that uh, our ecologist is going to come in and speak to our biology department so that the boys can then update it year on year. Yes, and I'm, I'm aware that there is... Um... There's certainly a bird watching group, uh, which one of the biology dons is, is running. Uh, he's been taking the boys out to look at that. Uh, and a part of, of understanding bio biodiversity is, is understanding what it tells you about age of land use. So with Littlewood, one of the key points about Littlewood, of course, is that it's actually full of um, wild anemones, which is a very slow growing plant and actually does tell us that this is, um, this is an ancient woodland. It, go it goes back You've seen it there on the maps in the 1760s. It possibly goes back to the 1700s. Uh, it's an old wood. Bagley wood, of course, is one of the great medieval woods. And part of, we go back to Singleton and Sewell, part of the choice of coming to Radley was not just the beautiful house or the fact that it was next to Oxford, but actually Singleton states specifically we have the river for aquatic activities, and we have Bagley Wood for sylvan activities, for excursions, for nature study. So actually part of the reason why they chose this place for the school is because of the medieval woodland around it, so that they could actually go out and enjoy sylvan activities. So I think we now reach the point where we, uh, we'll come to that later, shall we? <laughs> 
So <laughs> <Take it> back. <laughs> you're moving. You're moving as well. So take it back. Thank you. Um, we reached the point where we need to um, op open for discussion and look at some of the questions which have come through. So can we can we see some of those, Caroline? And has anybody got any, any memories that they want to actually specifically say at this point? I do. We, there is one question that was put onto the chat at the beginning. We could circle back round to, yep. um, which was about the sewage plants at College Pond, and what do you know what was built to replace the system? Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't. David might. Uh, the sewage plant was then moved to the other side of Kennington Road, uh, down by our uh, uh, maintenance store, which is next to the primary school. And that was, I don't know when it stopped being in operation, but some of the structure is still there today until the 1950s when we went on to, uh, when we went on to the mains and that's both the sewage and, uh, uh, and water, because up until that time, the water was uh, extracted from the borehole. There, there was a point, if we, if we go back to that map from 1914, where actually we, we were very much more self-sufficient than we are now. So we had our own sewage plant. We also uh, had our own gas um, gasometer. <laughs> so we were we were making our own power at one stage. Well, when, um, when you move on from that, Claire, the, the, the gas was only there for a short period, but you showed me that photograph of 1927, where we were trying mm. to work out where it was. Uh, and that's where we moved on to uh, electricity, which was in the, uh, early 1920s and, and okay bizarrely that that was down by the fives courts and that's why it's you know our electricity infrastructure should never be in the position where it is which is in the trees by c social uh, but that's just historical because that's where the it was called the power station uh, was built in the, 19, the early 1920s so we're kind of we're kind of stuck with all the infrastructure. Right. Um, so Tony Dinnett just had a, a comment that came up on the chat there about something by the Kennington Road. So what other questions do we have, Caroline? Anything else come up? Um, no, that, and that seems to be everything that we have on the chat so far. Um, if anybody else wants to ask any questions, do just um, come off mute and uh, ask away. I, I saw that somebody did um, comment about uh, the lodge up at the top of Lodge Hill. Um, yes, when I was researching Capability Brown, I had a close look at all of the Turner drawings, and he draws two, um, two structures up there with gates and so on. One which is clearly habitable and the other which is clearly um, a decorative folly. Um, and looking at what Turner draws, they're miniature versions of the boycott pavilions uh, which are at Stowe, which is what um, Capability Brown actually designed to live in with his family himself. So they are clearly by him. But whether they, that was what survived, because I, I think they were fairly Jim Cack buildings. Um, and I know that uh, some of the groundsmen have talked uh, about um, footings for buildings up at that point by, by obviously where you would have the gates and where the lodge would have been. So that was one question that came up. Uh, somebody else mentioned the archaeology group. Um, uh, that is something I'd, I'd really like to do a lot more work on. We don't have um, many of their finds or, or the finds record. Um, so at some stage, I'd like to come and talk to some of you if you're out there and uh, talk about what was what was found. Um. Brilliant. I think well we've kind of uh, timed out a little bit here, so I'm just going to share this final slide. Um, so do, thank you all for joining us. It was an absolutely brilliant event. Um, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed hearing perspectives from the past and from the present. Our next Radley Then and Now series will uh, be about the Don's plays. So please do look out for our events bulletin, which will tell you more about that uh, due to take place in April. Before you go, I'd also like to mention that we've had our new graphic timeline installed in Covered Passage. 
It's um, all the way along one of the walls. It's a fascinating journey through the history of the college over the last 175 years. So if you are um, ever on site or if you, you want to come and visit us, get in touch with us and um, you can have a look at that or you can come back on Old Radley and Day in September and see it then. So all that remains to say is thank you very much to our speakers. They were absolutely brilliant. And thank you very much to everyone attending. Do get in touch if you've got other further questions. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you in April at the Don's Play Archives event. Thank you.